Hey everybody, welcome to week 10 of PS398. Hard to believe I know, but we'll be two-thirds of the way done with the class once we're done with this stupid video. Uh, we'll have completed two sets of five weeks, and we'll have five more weeks to go. We're also coming up to a point where we're changing gears a little bit in terms of what we're studying, what we're talking about, and how we talk about it. Uh, don't get your hopes up, it's not suddenly be <laughs> gonna become less like it's been. Um, but, so, so up through here, we've talked about what is rationality in the individual sense. And we've talked about how do rational actors interact with one another in the simplest possible setting where they're both making a decision either simultaneously or as if simultaneously. It doesn't have to be that the two decisions are literally made at the same time. If I have two suspects in two separate interrogation chambers, nobody says, and then at exactly midnight, they make the same choice or they make a different choice or whatever. It is, they don't have to make the choice at the same exact literal clock time. If two suspects are in two separate interrogation chambers, what matters is neither can condition what they do on what the other one did. So the role of time in strategic situations isn't just, you know, coordinating in terms of at what moment somebody will be somewhere. Time, strategically, is about who gets to observe which moves made by which other actors. So consider chess. If I'm playing chess with you, first of all, I'm probably about to lose very badly. But second of all, if I have the white pieces and you have the black pieces, then what happens is I make the first move, I might move a pawn, and now it's your turn and you get to observe what I did. Then you get to make one and only one move. You might move a knight. And now it's my turn. I observe that I moved my pawn and that you moved your knight, right? So now I have observed other actions and I get to make another decision accordingly. It stands to reason that the second choice that I make, my second move, it stands to reason that it's influenced by my first move and by your first move. Similarly, it stands to reason that your first move was informed a little bit by my first move. So the role of time in strategy isn't like the role of clock time in our lives. The role of time and strategy is much more about who gets to see what has been done, who gets to know what. And so time is going to be the beginning of our way to think through what happens if not every choice is set up exactly as it's been up to this point in the simple simultaneous strategic form setting. What happens if we begin to allow for time? Which is good news because I'm not sure if you noticed, but it seems like time plays a big role in international relations. Right, so if I'm lending you money, if I'm, if I'm an international organization or some state that is loaning money to you, another state, I'm giving you money today, I'm giving you resources today. The potential payoff for that, what I'm hoping to get out of that, isn't something that happens today. If I write you a check today, presumably I'm not thinking about today in terms of when the realized payoffs that I want are. I'm thinking down the line. I'm looking ahead, I'm looking to the future. I'm foreseeing what I hope will be many choices on your part, to the point that I might attach strings. If I give you money, I, I might say, and then in the future, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. If I send money to you, then I insist that you use it, not for personal gain if you're an authoritarian leader or something, but rather to, to create infrastructure for your country. And so then I have to worry, because you get to make your decisions about whether to keep the money or to build infrastructure for the people of your country. You make that decision after having been handed a check. After, before, and after. We haven't said before and after. We haven't said before and after. We've said if, we've said if I had known that you had gone straight, then I would have swerved. But that's only a hypothetical. If I had actually had the chance to see you go straight, then I would get to make a decision to swerve after. There is no nuance left at that point in time. I would just swerve because I would know that you went straight. So the role of strategic before and strategic after seems really important. If I can't lend you money without thinking about the future, then what the heck is international credit? If I can't sign a treaty today without counting on you tomorrow, then what the heck is an alliance? If I can't draw a line somewhere in Europe and say, if you cross that, then there will be trouble, and I can't think about what the future is in terms of when you cross that line, how can I think about ultimata? The role of the future and the role of the past these seem like relevant features in international relations, and in all of politics, of course. But it seems especially relevant because under international anarchy, this is my international anarchy hand gesture, under international anarchy, it turns out that there's nobody there to enforce contracts. One thing that the state does is it enforces contracts. If we're citizens of the same country and we drop a contract, and then I violate the terms of the contract, you have 
legitimate legal recourse. You can go on Judge Judy or one of the not so commercial courts for this sort of thing and say, I have a dispute. The person that I have written down a contract with has breached that contract. If that happens in international relations, there isn't anybody, to, there is no international Judge Judy, for better or worse. There is not an international Judge Judy. There should be, but there isn't one. I'm not saying that from a world state perspective. I'm saying this from a I just want more Judge Judy everywhere perspective. If there's no enforcer of contracts, then any, every time that the two international actors write down an agreement with one another, they have to worry about what will happen in the future. They have to think through the strategy of the future, and they have to think about how what they expect will happen in the future influences the decisions that they make today. We haven't talked about any of this. We haven't talked about any of this. For all of the difficult problem sets, for all the wrinkles, for all the nuances, for all the explosions, for all the pictures of Cookie Monster, for all of that, for all of that, we haven't talked about time for a single second. We haven't talked about time. Today we're gonna begin to remedy that. Today I'd like to show you the next step up. The next step that usually, somebody usually takes when they're learning the theory of games is to talk about extensive form games, which are games that explicitly account for this time idea. So we're gonna take the setup that we had. We're gonna have players, we're going to have actions, we're gonna have utilities. That's a game, that's a strategic form game, that's everything you need to tell a story, right? That's what we've been talking about up to this point, the, the past few weeks. And we're going, I'm going to show you today how one incorporates a time structure into that. So much like the games lecture, my goal mostly is just to tell you some stories today. I want to show you some interesting ways to think about the role of time in a variety of international settings. Um, we'll also be talking about domestic politics a little bit when we talk about what the rule of law is. Boy, I just said that so casually. We'll also be talking about domestic politics a little bit when I discuss the somewhat trivial matter of, you know, the rule of law. <laughs> it's a weird class, right? We're gonna be using these games in the next few weeks and then we'll be extending them in, in some other ways as well. We'll be using structures like this pretty much for the rest of the class. We'll take another detour over into simultaneous move games that have been enriched in some other ways uh, for a couple of weeks moving on. But for the most part, extensive form games and the associated concept of sub-game perfect equilibrium, the associated refinement of Nash equilibrium to something that respects time, that's gonna be another one of the big good lord, I hope this is a take-home point that you walk away with sort of things. Some concepts that you're familiar with from your other classes will emerge here, and in fact, many of those concepts were really developed in the, in the form of extensive form games. Anytime you've heard something about credible commitment or the shadow of the future, anything like that, the, the, these terms come up very often. Credible commitment, when can I credibly commit to a particular deal? When do you believe that my commitment to a deal is credible? Whenever you hear concepts like those, there's an extensive form game underneath there somewhere. And so I hope that whenever you see these terms used uh, moving forward, that you're able to stop and pause and reflect and even start to sketch a little bit. What is the underlying structure that the author has in mind when they're talking about some credible commitment problem? So we need to talk for a long time about time, but we only have a limited amount of time to talk about that time. So let's get to it. In the A block, I'll show you a class of games that you might call opt-out games. This is gonna be the simplest possible extensive form game. We'll look at two or three different variants of it. Uh, the idea is just to show you exactly what these things look like and to try to help you to incorporate this into how you think. My sense is that this will be a little bit more intuitive for you than strategic form games and matrices were. In general, extensive form games are gonna be a little bit more intuitive, which is both good and bad. You'll have a sense about how to get started when you study something, but sometimes your intuitions won't always lead you to the best place. So my hope is that this A block can show you what we're talking about, about extensive form games, without hinting too much at other things that might give you some wonky intuitions. You'll see what I mean as we, as we keep going. You just trust me a little bit. Famous last words. In the B block, I want to complicate our setup a little bit by allowing for infinite strategy sets by showing you a very well-known and important game in international relations called the Ultimatum Game. If it isn't the most important game in formal international relations theory, I don't know what would be more important off the top of my head. The Ultimatum Game plays a big role in a lot of different parts of international relations as we know it, theoretical or otherwise. Uh, you'll, you'll see a very stark characterization about what bargaining looks like once we've equipped it with a particular protocol, a take-it-or-leave-it ultimatum game protocol. So we've talked about bargaining problems up to this point, but we haven't talked about the associated protocols very much just yet. 
And so now will be the time for us to tell stories about what happens during bargaining problems. How do bargaining problems manifest themselves? And how have people tried to work around those bargaining problems by developing bargaining protocols? Well, the ultimatum game is one of the best known, if not the best known, bargaining protocol. And then the C block, I want to enrich our theory a little bit more uh, by showing you what an information set is. And in order to show you that, we'll talk about a well-known model of the rule of law. What's nice about information sets is they allow us to find some intermediate amount of I know what happened in the past. So in strategic form games, nobody knows anything about what happened in the past. In an extensive form game, in, as usually written, everybody gets to know everything about what happened in the past. Information sets allow for the possibility of some decisions are made with some ignorance about what happened in the past. And so the rule of law game, we're going to use that information set apparatus to say, well, there's two factions in society, and if they see a ruler do something nasty, they would like to coordinate on throwing that ruler out. But because coordination is difficult for factions in this authoritarian regime that aren't just allowed to walk out into the streets and say, hey, we're coming to fight, come on, come join us while we're fighting. Apparently that's how people get ready to fight. They're just like, hey, what's up everybody? Let's go fight, time to go fight. I just spit on my nose while I did that. I don't say that very often. I don't fight too, too, too often anymore. You know, because of that, we have to allow for something happens in the past, the ruler does something nasty, but then the citizens might not be able to coordinate well, and we need to, and you'll see that we use information sets as a technical way to, to encode that idea that you can see some things that happened in the past, but not everything that happened, okay? You'll see what I mean. I keep saying you'll see what I mean, but literally, you'll see what I mean. You'll see what I mean today. So you can imagine, I'm really looking forward to showing you some of this stuff because it's super fun, it's super intuitive, it's a lot more visual, and so you get to see some more of my beautiful baby face. You know, because I'm not going to be blocked by matrices. So you have that to look forward to, and you're like, oh, yeah, I got that to look forward to. And I'm like, yeah, you have that to look forward to. But let's stop looking forward. Let's get to the end of our story of time. Let's get started. So here in the A block, I want to show you a, a few different games that are appropriate for introductory analysis of the extensive form type. Uh, I think that these are going to be games that's easy for you to get your bearings. You'll have a sense about what's going on as opposed to the other times. These should be a good way for you to get your feet wet and to get a sense about what international relations looks like when we explicitly incorporate time into it. So in order to get things started, I want to talk about the simplest possible model of a very important concept, deterrence. So deterrence is an ancient concept. Uh, you know, the basic idea is what features of an interaction, what features of one actor in an interaction can stop another actor from trying to do something nasty to them? Can I stop you from attacking me? Can I stop you from issuing threats to me? Can I stop you from trying to sanction me? What are the things that make you not do nasty things to me. Under anarchy, you can do nasty things to me if you want to. There is no recourse. I can't go tattle to some school teacher. An interesting question is, hey, if peace is enjoyed more by the powerful, if I get better negotiated settlements if I'm strong, then what feature, what does that end up looking like, right? Is there another way to see that fact? And the answer is yes, and a simple deterrence model helps us to see that. I'm gonna talk my way through a game tree so that you can see what it looks like I'll introduce the terms as we go, but I'm never just going to say, and formally, this is a decision node, and this is a terminal node. I'll try to use shape and color and all the usual tricks to help send the message home. And I think that mostly by doing this by way of example will be the easiest way to proceed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show time moving from left to right on our screen, okay? So you can think about things that happen here as earlier and things that happen here as later. Again, this is strategic time in the sense that the decisions made over here potentially will be observable for the decisions made over here. So time is gonna flow from left to right. Strategic time is gonna flow from left to right. And so some of these decisions will be observable by some of the decision makers over here down the tree. You'll see what I mean. So at the beginning of time, country A makes a decision. And in order to show that, at the, as far left as I can go on the screen, I'll put a decision node, a little circle, with an A to let you know that this is country A. So state A has a decision node. And the idea is that at any decision node, a given actor will have some choices to make. It wouldn't be very interesting if we gave them a single thing to choose over. They would just pick it. So I'll go with the simplest binary decision that's still interesting. Okay? 
So they can make one of two choices. And in order to show you that, I'm gonna draw two edges, two lines coming out of this decision node. So here's a decision node. It says country A on it to let you know that country A is making this decision. And then there are two lines emanating from that node. These are called edges. These are called edges. And each of these edges represents a choice that country A could make. So in this example, country A can either issue a threat, they can ride up this upper edge and make a threat to country B. So they could issue a threat, they could say, hey, give me some stuff, or they could not. They could just accept the status quo. They could, they could do nothing. In order to convey that, I'll just attach the, the actions that could be done to each of their respective edges. So in other words, right now, up to this point, I have drawn country A can either issue a threat or do nothing. If they issue a threat, then we'll allow country B to make a decision. And so at the edge, at, and so at the edge of this edge, at the end of this edge, I'll put a decision node for country B. Here's a decision node for country B. And country B has one of two choices. They can either acquiesce to the threat. They can acquiesce to the threat. They can say, okay, yep, you got me. You win country A, whatever you want. Or they can fight. So they can acquiesce or they can fight. So now I've got, I've got three naked edges so far. I've got three edges that don't have any, any nodes at the end of them just yet. I'm gonna resolve that by putting what are called terminal nodes at each of these edges. So there are three possible endings of this story. There are three possible endings of this story. One of the endings is if country A doesn't issue a threat, then we wind up at an ending of the story that you might call the status quo. If country A doesn't do anything, then we find ourselves at an ending of the story called the status quo. That's a terminal node. Boom. That's the end of the story. If that's the decision the country A makes, that's the end. If country A issues a threat and country B acquiesces, right? So if we, if we go all the way up, if we ride that as high as we can, then we wind up at a terminal node that you might call acquiescence. Country A is very happy, right? So this is an ending where country A has gotten some goodies out of country B because country, a, country B has acquiesced to the threat. Finally, if country A issues a threat and country B fights, then we wind up at a terminal node you might call war. So look, we've got two states, country A, country B, and they're each equipped with a binary decision, and country B can only makes their binary decision some of the time, but regardless, we wind up at this situation where there's three possible endings of the story, and which ending emerges depends on decisions that the two countries made. In that sense, this is still a game. This is a game just like before, but it's somewhat richer. So in, in simple models like these, where you see all the terminal nodes, where you see every ending of the story, then intuitively enough, I can say to you that we put utility functions on each of the terminal nodes. A, a, now a utility function is, is a device that reads in terminal nodes and spits out happiness numbers. But in reality, each terminal node belongs to a series of decisions, a series of choices made by each player. And you refer to those series of choices as histories, right? So I can find there are three different histories of this game. There's the history where nothing happened. There's the history where country A made a threat and country B fought. And there's the history where country A made a threat and country B acquiesced to that threat. So there's three histories and each of them is associated in this simple example with a terminal node. So I'm just going to put utility numbers next to each of these terminal nodes. I'll put country A's on top and then country B's on the bottom. So if country A does nothing, right? If they don't do anything, we'll call that the status quo. We'll say zero happiness points for country A. We'll say that the status quo just gives them some payoff of zero, normalize that to zero and say, whatever their status quo cost would have been, we'll just call that the zero point. And country B will say that they get one happiness point for having not been bothered. I don't know about you, but even if you fight, even if you don't acquiesce to a threat, it's annoying to have to deal with it, right? Somebody mails you a threat. And you're like, you open the letter, you get out your letter opener and you go, Shh, and then you open, you say, whatever could this be? Right. You look at the letter and on the letter, it says, I'm going to get you. And you're like, ah, and then you think it through. You're like, oh, wait, no, I don't mind fighting. But still, you had to do all this letter opening. There was a letter opener. Oh, my goodness. No, 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 no. So country B gets one happiness point for the status quo. Now, let's suppose that country A issues the threat and country B acquiesces to the threat. All right, then we'll say that that gives country A one happiness point. Now they've got some stuff that they didn't have back in the status quo. And we'll say the country B gets minus one happiness points. This makes them very sad. They just have to give some goodies to country A. They just acquiesce to a threat. They look like an idiot. And if country A issues a threat and country B 
um, fights, then we'll call that a war outcome. We'll say that zero happiness points for country B and minus one happiness points for country A. Country A doesn't want to fight. Country B doesn't mind fighting in this model, right? That's what I'm saying. When I make the utility numbers that way, what I'm saying right now is country B doesn't like to give stuff up and they don't mind fighting. And country A doesn't like fighting, but they like to get stuff. So the combinations of, of happiness point numbers is going to be really important because when country A makes their choice, if they, if they don't do anything, then they control their destiny. They know they can lock in zero happiness points for sure. But if they issue a threat, then what winds up happening, whether they get the minus one of fighting or the one of, of getting the goodies, whether or not they prefer the status quo to what ultimately happens if they issue a threat is no longer in their hands. That's in country B's hands. Country B is the decider of what happens after threats are made. So country A right now, they're having to think to themselves, I can do nothing and get zero happiness points, or I can issue a threat and then maybe I'll get minus one for fighting and maybe I'll get one for getting goodies or what, I don't know. So country A is having to look down the tree. When you make a decision, when you're country A and you make a decision about whether or not to issue a threat, when you make a decision about whether or not to issue a threat, you have to look down the tree because what winds up happening is out of your hands now. You've unleashed a fury. Okay? And that fury is country B potentially saying, I like this lower edge more than this upper edge. So I'm calling these all opt-out opt games. All the games I'm going to show you so far are going to be ones where somebody can either choose to keep the game going or opt out. So country one here can either end the game or make it keep going. And then country B, because they're the last decider at the end of time, because they're the last decider, it doesn't really look like they keep the interaction going. They can either end it one way or end it the other way. But there's nothing to stop us, as you'll see here in a few minutes, from having longer interactions. This is just the simplest possible introductory extensive form game. This simple model of deterrence is a very nice way to get your feet wet in terms of thinking about time. State B gets to observe what state A did. State A acts before state B acts. State A can act in a way that stops state B from acting. State A has to look down the tree about what state B will do for some of the decisions that they make, but not others of the decisions that they make. There's a lot of fascinating interplay here that's intertemporal. It's no longer just strategy. Now it's time and strategy. It's pretty cool, right? It's not that big of a tweak. Think about it. I just showed you a completely different kind of analysis. I just showed you a completely different kind of game in a sense. With time and edges and nodes, you hadn't heard about edges and nodes before. And look, none of us is an expert in graph theory, but suddenly it's not hard for you. It's not hard for you to take the setup that we've had and come with me in, in this modification and come with me in this extension, because this is a very natural way to think. Maybe it's because we all learn games with games like chess, where I move, then you move, and then I move, and then you move, and then I move, then you move. It's interesting to think about how different kinds of strategic actors are able to observe choices made before, or are able to think ahead to decisions that haven't even been made yet. And you'll see next week when we start to talk about how to analyze these games, it's very much a study in looking down the tree and thinking through what will happen under the assumption of rationality. So this is a nice model of deterrence. I just want to show you how you might extend it with one extra move and wind up with touching another really important concept in international relations. So let me show you a quick model of audience costs. So the audience cost model is actually very similar to the deterrence model. The basic idea in an introductory audience cost model is actually exactly the same as the idea in a deterrence model. It just will add one extra little stage at the end. And then this is a nice model for us to enrich once we start to talk about private information in a few weeks. We only have a few weeks left. Wow. There's so many things I wish I could show you. So again, I'm just going to have time moving from left to right. And the, it's still going to be two countries, country A and country B. We're going to have the same set of players as before. I'm just going to add a final decision made by country A. So here's the basic idea. At the beginning of time, country A makes a choice. Country A can either decide to do nothing, opt out and do nothing, or they can issue a threat to country B. Just like before. Just like before. Terminal node. This is going to be an opt out to the terminal node. And this is going to be a keep the thing going. Okay. If country A doesn't do anything, then yeah, we find ourselves at a terminal node. But if country A issues a threat, 
then country B gets to make a choice. Now here I'm gonna modify the story a little bit by saying that country B doesn't take us straight to war. I'm gonna say country B can either acquiesce, they can, they can say, you know what, you're right, here, take, take the stuff, please don't hit us. Or they can prepare for battle. They can say, okay, fine, come on, let's do it. Okay, so if they acquiesce, then that's the end of time again. If they acquiesce, then that's the end of time. There's another terminal node. However, if they say, okay, fine, name a time, name a place, come on. You wanna fight? Fight, well, just say where. So then country A gets to make another decision. They can either back down themselves or they can fight. And then we wind up at war. So it's threaten, don't threaten. Prepare for battle, acquiesce, uh, back down, or fight. And that's the end of time then. So we've taken the original deterrence model, and now we've said, what happens if somebody forces you to put your money where your mouth is? The basic idea of an audience cost model is that your population, if you're a leader, if you're a leader and you issue a threat and somebody calls you on it, and then you back down because you didn't actually mean the threat. Suppose that you were bluffing. If you were bluffing, you don't, really, you don't really feel like fighting, but you issue a threat to try to get some goodies. And then the country that you threaten says, all right, fine, let's fight. Then the idea is that you might back down, and if you back down, now you look like an idiot. And by look like an idiot, I mean you might get executed by your people. Because it turns out that populaces aren't a huge fan of it when you issue threats, get called out, and then back down. That makes your country look like an idiot, and people don't like that. In a democracy, they might vote you out. In an autocracy, they might kill you, or exile you, or something like that. That's bad. So the idea with audience costs is it's the beginning of a way to incorporate domestic politics into this international process of making threats. And the original idea it was that democracies uh, were more successful when they issued threats because they had this audience cost to keep them honest. So if I make you a threat and I'm a democracy, then I must really mean it because there's an audience cost threat waiting for me if I back down. That's the basic idea. You, you don't know. If I issue a threat, you don't know if I really mean it or not. We haven't modeled that just yet. But just keep your ears open for a second. If I issue a threat, you don't know if I really mean it. And if you call me out on it and, and you don't want to fight, if I'm a democracy, my threat means more because was the idea because it could well be that these audience costs are something that I fear and I wouldn't issue a threat unless I was truly planning on fighting. The problem is that authoritarians also experience audience costs. This was a development in the literature in the last 10 years. So it, it might not be a great way for us to distinguish different kinds of regime type, but it's still a really important mechanism that links domestic politics, to international politics. And in fact, the fact that it happens for both authoritarian and democratic reasons means that this is just a nice way to think about different levels interacting with one another. So let me put some numbers in here. I've got four terminal nodes now, right? I've got the original status quo, the situation after acquiescence, and then a war and a back down outcome to think about. So we'll say just like before, the status quo gets country A zero happiness points and country B one happiness point. We'll say that the acquiescence outcome gets country A one happiness point and country B zero happiness points. And so they, trans they transfer the goodie. We'll say that the back down outcome gives country A minus A happiness points where A is the audience cost. A is the price of being of having to back down after somebody called you out on your threat. So A is a parameterization of the audience cost. It could be minus one, it could be minus 10, whatever. We'll just put minus A. And then country B, they get to look tough because they, they said, fine, name a time and a place, and then somebody backed down on them. So now they've got some reputational coolness to play with. We'll give them two happiness points for that. And then in, in something that'll be pretty common for us for the for remaining few weeks, if war happens, we'll just say W sub A and W sub B. These will just be war payoffs for country A and for country B, respectively. Those are just a useful stand-in. I don't want to have to model war right now. We've talked about how to model war a few different ways. Bargaining model of war, conflict model of war. I don't want to pick one. I'm just going to say the war outcome right now is W sub A and W sub B, where I could model that a lot of different ways if I wanted to. Right? You can always add. You can always add, but it's 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 important to get the, the simple structure down first. So this is an audience cost model. This is an introductory audience cost model where the basic idea is country A has a tough choice to make, not just because they have to think about what country B will do, but about whether or not they actually want to live up to the threat that they make if somebody calls their bluff. That's really interesting, right? Because now time hits country A two times. Time hits country A two times. At the beginning of time, they have a tough decision to make where they have to look down the tree to both country B and a future version of themselves. 
And then by the, at the end of time, they have another choice to make a, after having observed themselves make a threat and then country B say, okay, fine, name a time and a place. So country A has a really nuanced and difficult thing to think through. What's a strategy for country A, right? Is it like what they do here? Is that separate from what they do here? Or is it one unified decision that they make? It's a tough question, right? We'll talk about this next week. I just want to get you thinking about what time does to these actors when they make their decisions. Is country A's threat credible in the sense that they will actually live up to the threat? They will not back down. They will fight. They are prepared to fight. Is their threat credible? And what does that mean for country B's decision? And then what does that mean for country A's decision? Right? There's still going to be interdependence. It's just a very different kind of interdependence. Country B has to think through. Is country A's threat that I just observed credible? If so, acquiesce. If no, name a time and a place. And then country A has to think through that thing I just said about country B when they decide whether or not to issue a threat in the first place. So in a very simple and straightforward way, we have incorporated time in a way that it covers this important ancient notion of deterrence, but also gets us almost up to date in terms of a, a nice theoretical concept in the current literature like audience costs. Time plays a big role even though it doesn't have to create a big change. Just to take the opt-out idea to its very furthest point, I want to show you a not-so-IR model that's very useful. If you get interested in game theory or experimental political science, then you'll probably see something called the Centipede game eventually, and I might as well show it to you now. So Centipede, they tell me Centipede was based on a way that pirates used to divide up booty. I don't know if that's true. So the basic idea is as follows. There's a pool of money on the table. Just imagine we're two pirates. I'm a pirate, you're a pirate. We are two pirates. I'm Willie Stargell, you're Roberto Clemente. Lucky you, you're Roberto Clemente. So the idea is that we start off the interaction and I have one piece of gold in front of me. Here's a pile of gold. You have nothing in front of you. We're at a table on the pirate ship. So there's, there's a pile of gold and there's you and there's me and I've got one gold piece. And I can either take it and then we're done or I can pass it to you. And the idea is if I pass the gold to you, then some gold comes out of the pot. And, and now I handed you one gold doubloon and now you get another out of the pot. So now you have two and I have none. And you can either take it and end the interaction or you can pass it back to me. Now, an interesting thing is after each round, after we both turned it down, then we each get a doubloon. Right? So if you pass it back to me, now I've got three and you've got one because we went through one round of, of, we, of we passed it back and forth. So now I've got three and you've got one. And I can either keep it, I can either keep it and the game and keep it, or I can pass it back to you. And now you've got four and I've got one. You, you, you're guaranteed the one. You're guaranteed the one. The idea is with every iteration, you can just put some in your bank and so on. We just keep pushing this money back and forth. It slowly grows. It slowly grows because every time we pass, there's another gold doubloon going in. And every time we make it through two rounds, we each get to take one for our personal banks. Right? So we're passing this gold, this back and forth. The pile of gold gets very big very quickly. But every time there's a chance for you to opt out. You can say, you know what? I'm done. I'm just going to keep this big pile of gold in front of me. And then the pirate next to you is really angry, as pirates tend to be. And then they say things that pirates say when they're angry. Oh, I don't want to do this. I'm not an actor. Shiver me timbers. Ahoy there! Yarg. Arrgh. Who decided that pirates talk like that? Who decided that pirates Arrgh. talk like that? Nobody. Do we have evidence of that? The pirates go, Yarg, shiver me timbers. Arrgh, 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 arrgh. There's no evidence that I'm aware of that pirates actually talk like that. Maybe pirates were incredibly erudite. Land ho! Nothing makes your brain get really erudite quite like scurvy. Blimey. So that's the centipede game. I'm going to show you a two round version of the centipede game, but you can imagine extending it forever because the interaction is theoretically allowed to go on forever. We're each going to get two chances to make a decision. So at the beginning of time, me, country A slash pirate A, I can either take the money or I can pass the money. If I take it, then that's the end of time and I get one doubloon and you get zero doubloons. If I pass it, then you, pirate or country B, can make a choice. I wasn't really planning on pirates coming up today. So, you can either pass the money or take the money. 
If you take the money, then it's zero doubloons for me and two doubloons for you. Now, if you pass, then me, Pirate A, gets to make a choice. I can either take the money or I can pass. If I take the money, then it's three doubloons for me and one doubloon for you. See, this is why I say happiness points. You don't know if a, a happiness point might be we're hanging out together at the couches of the Illini Union and the Associated Bliss, or it could be a literal gold doubloon, or a penny in a bowl, or hawkish dovish, or a lottery ticket. Think about all the things that happiness points do for us. Think about all of the different kinds of things that utility functions, if we're smart and humble and flexible about what they do and what they can't do, we can cover a lot of different kinds of interactions with them. Finally, if I pass, then you will make a final decision. You can either make a final pass decision or a take decision. If you pass, then we'll say that's three doubloons apiece. Otherwise, it's two doubloons for me and four doubloons for you. So there's what? There's five terminal nodes. The one where I ended the game and just took a doubloon. The one where you ended the game and just took two doubloons. The one where I ended the game, I got three, you got one. The one where... Um, where it was like a balanced 3-3, and the one where it was a not-so-balanced 4-4. Uh, 2-4. Two, two, two for me and 4 for you. This is called the centipede game. Why? Because it looks like a centipede. There's a reason that I got this stock image of a centipede. You'd be like, oh boy, these things look very similar to one another. Centipede game. Opt-out, opt-out, opt-out. Bunch of different opt-out decisions. Every time that the pirate passes the gold, they forewent a chance. Forewent, foregone. Forewent. Forgone, forwent a chance to take the money. They they forwent a chance to opt out. They didn't opt out. They kept the interaction going. This is one of those interactions that you can kind of just keep going. So if we're two countries involved in emissions reductions, right? I can cut mine, and then you can cut yours, and then I can cut mine, and then you can cut yours. And then suddenly I'm like, oh, well, the air is clean, and I'm just going to let you pay all the costs. So I've decided to allow my polluting industries to suddenly pollute again. And now the world is better because we've both been passing for a while, but I got I got to, to, to be a jerk about the costs. The centipede game, if you think about it, is a chance for this continual maintenance of something. We're continually maintaining something that just keeps getting better and better if we can just manage to keep cooperating. The centipede game, essentially, the logic of it says, if we can just keep passing, things keep getting better and better. Look how much bigger the happiness point numbers are here than they are over here. A 1-0 versus a 3-3 or a 2-4, things keep getting better if we can keep passing. If we could just keep cooperating with one another, things would keep getting better. But every second on the strategic clock gives us a chance to opt out. Doesn't that sound like something that happens? We need to continually maintain our relationship. We need to continually maintain the terms of some agreement. We need to continually maintain our security agreement. We need to continually maintain our uh, environmental agree agreement, our economic agreement. We have to continually maintain these things, even though there's always some chance to opt out. It's kind of interesting when you think about it. But right now, guess, what do you think is going to be the outcome of this game once we've studied it? Do you think it's going to be a happy ending or a sad ending? Oh boy, I just gave it away given that you know how much I love happy endings. It's kind of interesting when you see it that way, right? It's not just a centipede. Centipede isn't a model of centipedes. It's a model of, of maintaining something that keeps getting better, but where there's a continual threat of taking all those benefits. It's pretty cool. So three different opt-out games, three different substantive stories, one unified idea. It could be that all the time does is make me have to think through, do I want to issue a threat? It could be that what time does is I, I have to think through whether I want to issue a threat, but where I have to think both about whether somebody will believe me and whether I'm willing to live up to the terms of that threat once push comes to shove, if somebody forces me to actually lay my cards on the table. And then finally, how do we keep maintaining a positive relationship? How do we keep maintaining the benefits of some interaction, even though one of us at any point in time has a chance to screw things up? Opt out. Three different models of opt-out, one unified idea of what happens if you can end the game and what happens if you can keep the game going. Fascinating if you think about it hard enough, which I encourage you to do. However, we have only so much more time to talk about time. I'd like to show you how to enrich the model by thinking about deeper, richer strategy spaces. We'll talk about the ultimatum game over in the B block.
So here in the B block, I want to show you one of my very favorite games, the Ultimatum game. So the Ultimatum game is going to be your first intertemporal bargaining game. It'll be the first game that in incorporates some dynamic strategy. I'm going to make an offer to you, and you can either take it or leave it. And that's about as simple as a bargaining offer gets. So my main goal here is just to show you exactly what the game looks like, what this aesthetic difference is going to be in terms of the ultimatum game. You'll see what I mean in a second. And also to drive home the point that this is indeed a bargaining interaction, even if it doesn't look like one to you instantaneously. The basic idea of the bargaining game is I'm going to, there's some pie that we would like to divide. There's some resource that we're, that we're figuring out how to divvy up. It might be territory, it might be something else. There's some perfectly divisible resource that we're trying to figure out who gets what of it. We could be trying to figure out how to draw a border in a canonical example. This is a model of flat, flat land very straightforwardly. So this time I'm going to move top down just to keep things spicy. Well, at the beginning of time, country A is going to make a decision. And so this time, country A isn't going to choose to go to the left or to the right. Issue a threat, don't issue a threat. Acquiesce, back down, whatever. We're not going to have those sort of binary choices. They're not going to be discrete choices. Instead, they're going to be choosing a level. They're going to set a level. So the idea here is that country A is going to choose some X that lives between zero and one. It could be zero, it could be one, or it could be in between. So they're gonna choose some X that lives between zero and one. How would I draw that? I can't do it with my fingers, right? So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna draw this little Assassin's Creed hoodie. Whoop, okay. And the idea here is that here's X equals zero, and here's X equals one. If I chose the, the zero level, it's here. If I chose the one level, it's here. Anything else falls somewhere along the bottom of the hoodie and I just choose some X, right? So here's X equals zero, here's X equals one, here's X equals one half. Here's three fifths, here's two fifths, nine tenths, one tenth, and so on. I could choose, if I'm country A, I can choose some X that lives between zero and one. After whatever X I choose, country B can make a choice. So I choose an X, it might be a small X, it might be a big X, but it's one X that lives between zero and one. And regardless, country B, after they observe the X, they see the offer that I made, and they can either choose to accept it or reject it. Now they have just a simple binary choice. So country B can either accept or reject the X that got offered to them. But well, think about it. Before, there was like one country B decision. It was like, I can either do nothing or I can make a threat. And then there was like one country B decision. There was one decision node for country B. Here, there's an infinite number of decisions the country B might have to make depending on the X that they saw. Right, there's a lot of different country B decisions. We're gonna have to think that through next week. It's gonna make me go a little bit bald, you'll see. But as for now, it's already fascinating to think about all of the contingencies the country B might have to think through. Because country B has to be thinking to themselves, what happens if I observe X equals zero? What happens if I observe X equals one? What happens if I observe X equals pi over one plus pi? Or Chewie's birthday over one plus Chewie's birthday? Or any other number that you can think of, right? What happens then? That's a hard question. But as for now, in this compact story that we've told, all it is is country A chooses some level X between zero and one, and then conditional on that X, country B can either accept or reject. Now, if country B accepts, if country B accepts, then we'll say that we live up to the terms of the deal. Country A gets X happiness points, and country B gets one minus X happiness points. Okay, notice that this X and one minus X were determined by the initial decision made by country A. Right? So in other words, the happiness that comes from a negotiated settlement is endogenous to the offer that was made. Right? That's how things usually work. That's how things work. But we haven't really had the apparatus up to this point to talk about something like that. Now you see the happiness that comes from negotiated settlements is endogenous to decision made by country A. Is country A going to have advantages because they get to set those terms? Are they going to have disadvantages because they have to set those terms? Does country B have advantages for moving last? Do they have disadvantages for not getting a chance to set the agenda? Who has the advantage in this interaction? It's fascinating when you think about it that way. That's what time allows you to think about. Would you rather move early or would you rather move late? It's not an easy choice. And sometimes it's easy, right? So, I mean, if you're if it's college football and you win the toss for overtime, you know that you want to defend second. But a lot of the time, whether you want to move first or second or last, you have to think that interaction through very deeply. And then we'll say, if, if the deal is rejected, if the deal is rejected, then we'll just have some exogenous disagreement point. I'll just call it D sub A and D sub B. 
In general, we're going to have those add up to something less than one, though. The idea is that if disagreement happens, then it's not going to be as good as if agreement had happened. In the sense that D, DA plus DB, right, these two disagreement point utilities, it would be, you know, those are going to sum to something less than what would happen if we came to a deal. That's kind of what makes this bargaining, right? So country A makes a take it or leave it ultimatum offer to country B, and country B can either accept it, and then we get the terms of the deal as specified by country A's proposal, or we get some exogenously given disagreement point determined by how good the outside options are. Are you strong? Are you good under autarky if you fail to reach a trade deal? Can you defend yourself without an ally? Can you win a war if you need to? Whatever. Right, disagreement, there's all sorts of downsides if we fail to make deals. And so this ultimatum game is a way to say, one country makes a take it or leave it offer. Give me Alsace Lorraine. Respect my ethnic kinsman's wishes within your borders or else. This is a way that you can encode the notion of making an offer, take it or leave it. Now, I promise you that this is a bargaining problem. So let's just think that through. Let's visualize this as a bargaining problem real fast. So I need to go to a utility imputation space for that, don't I? So we'll put country A's happiness on this axis. And we'll cut country B's happiness on this axis. They're utilities for any of the outcomes. Let me start by plotting the negotiated settlement utility imputations. That's basically every X1 minus X combination, right? So if X equals zero, that's the worst deal from country A standpoint and the best from country B standpoint. We wind up at zero, one x equals 0, 1 minus x equals 1. That's up here. So at this point, country, Z, country A has 0 happiness points and country B has 1 happiness point. That's if x equals 0. If x equals 1, it's the exact opposite, where country A has gone, we've gone 1 unit over for country A, and we're not, we haven't gone up at all because country B is at 0 happiness points. If x equals 1, then x 1 minus x is 1, 0. If x equals one half, if it's if I choose a 50-50 div division of the dollar, then that means x equals one half, one minus x equals one half, and we're at one half, one half. If x equals one quarter, if I say I'll keep 25% of the pie and you take 75% of the pie, then we're at x equals uh, x equals one quarter and one minus x equals three quarters. That's over here. And the same over here. I can trace this entire line. This is the set of all x, 1 minus x, when x lives between 0 and 1. And it's just the top of a stupid triangle. We can't get away from the triangle. The triangle is everywhere. Why is the triangle surrounding us? It's the same lessons. You just keep learning the same lessons. You just keep piling them. Just little tiny lessons. Next thing you know, you have a mountain of lessons that isn't so stupid. Even though every little lesson along the way was really stupid. And we said that if country B rejects the deal, then we wind up at the disagreement point DA and DB, where we decided that DA plus DB is less than 1. Well, that, if DA plus DB is less than 1, then that means that the disagreement point lives southwest of the frontier. Next thing you know, we have a bargaining problem. We see a bargaining range emerge, the set of all Pareto optimal possible outcomes that Pareto dominate the disagreement point. That's this range right here. And so here's a question for you. Again, put a pin in this, but try to answer this question. Which outcome do you think will happen in this model? It's no longer going to be something from the bargaining range. Now it's going to be a particular point. Which point? Disagreement or somewhere along this range? Which of these outcomes, this infinity plus one possible things that could happen? Infinity plus one. God, I'm an idiot. But you know what I mean. This, this range plus this other little possibility, what's going to happen? What's going to be the outcome of this model? This game has a unique equilibrium. It has a unique equilibrium. So tell me which point in this space is going to be the outcome. It's kind of hard to think about, right? I bet you now you're like, oh, just get me to next week. We're already saying that because that would mean we're one week closer to being done with this. And I'm there right there with you. So this is indeed a bargaining problem where we've encoded a particular institution for trying to figure out what the outcome will be. And this is sort of the most anarchical institution, the beginning of a haggle. Here's my offer. Take it or leave it. Now, what happens if we kept haggling? Just imagine people that are actually haggling. You, I make an offer to you. You reject it. Does that mean that the interaction has to end? No. 
Maybe you make a counteroffer. Have you ever bought something off of Facebook or, or anything like that? Whenever you buy something off of social media or somewhere else on the internet, they, you make an offer, they reject it, they counteroffer. You hear the counteroffer. You either accept it or you come back with another counteroffer. And so on. You might go through many iterations. Maybe not for buying something off of Facebook, but when you buy a house, if you ever buy a house, there will be many iterations of negotiations. When one of you becomes president and you're making you're under negotiations with one of the other parties uh, who's going to be your vice president, that's a that's a really complicated negotiation. I have a sense about which of you it's going to be and which of you it's not going to be. Well, we'll just have to see. Now we have time. And so if I wanted to, I could enrich this by talking about an alternating offers bargaining model. So if I was writing down an alternating offers bargaining model, it would start like this. At the beginning of time, country A chooses some X between 0 and 1. After observing X, country B can either accept the deal or reject it. If they accept the deal, then they live up to the terms of that deal, X and 1 minus X. If not, then country B can make a counteroffer. Country B chooses some Y between 0 and 1. So country A made an offer, it got, re it got rejected, and now... Country B says, oh, I, I won't give you 100 bucks for the stereo, but I'll give you 50. And then country A can either accept the deal or reject it. And the, let's just say this is a single iteration version. So we'll say that if they accept the deal, then we get Y and 1 minus Y. Otherwise, we wind up, wind up with D sub A and D sub B, the disagreement point. We failed to make a deal before the time limit. You could extend this as many iterations as you wanted to. If you knew that there was a last day, if you knew that there was a deadline, for when a deal can be made, then you could say that that allows for some number of iterations of this alternating offers. If you didn't know when a last day was, if you didn't have a, a final day, then you could just say it goes on forever, potentially. There's infinite horizon bargaining. Not because we think that there's an actual infinite time horizon, but because nobody knows when the last day is. And as a preview of coming attractions, these terminal nodes are going to play a really big deal in our analysis of introductory extensive form games. If I say there is no end of time, that isn't because I think that there really isn't an end of time. It's because I think that the end of time shouldn't influence the decisions because the players don't know when the end of time would be. Suddenly you feel very differently about time, right? Time as we experience it as, as human beings or as just a, a life forms, that's one thing. Time as we think about it, as it interacts with strategy, is a completely different thing. When you think about the future as a person versus when you think about the future as a negotiator, that's different. Isn't that weird? So we're going to be seeing a lot of these Assassin's Creed hoodies moving on for the rest of the, of the class. These play a really important role in international relations theory at the present moment. And it turns out that a very broad class of interactions can be distilled into ultimatum games if we look at them hard enough. So you'd be surprised at just how many things share an underlying structure with ultimatum games, even if they don't immediately seem to prima facie. What makes ultimatum games different from the games that I showed you before, and also a little bit more nuanced to study, is this infinite strategy set thing. The fact that we're choosing a level, we're setting some slider, right? There's some amount of the pie that I'm going to keep for myself, and some amount of the pie that I'll leave for you. So the idea here is I'm not making a choice so much as I'm making a proposal. I am proposing some setup for us. You can imagine the focal points will play a big role in something like this. So if I was choosing a tax rate, I probably wouldn't come up with some very strange numbers for tax rates that live in between here. I would probably go in 1%, 2%, 3%. I might have some natural units that X gets carved into. Focal points might simplify this by saying, actually, it isn't in all of the possible tax rates. It's actually some subset of them where they make sense in your head for focal points, what are reasons. Or if I was deciding how much of the territory to keep for myself and how much of the territory to leave for you, maybe there's a river. And I would say, I'm going to take up to the river. And then you take thereafter. And so you could imagine taking this complicated Assassin's Creed decision set and say, okay, actually it's discrete. It's simpler in ways than you might realize. But there's no reason to say that that will always be the case in the abstract. We have to be prepared for truly divisible proposals. However, it's, a it's possible to imagine simplifying this, and in fact, that's going to play an important part in the analysis. You'll see what I mean momentarily. Regardless, I hope that this has you interested, because this ultimatum game, it's difficult to overstate its importance in international relations. Under anarchy, this is how a lot of decisions get made. 
And we'll see next week. Just to, just put a star in your notes and say next week we're going to learn that it's really nuanced to study this sort of thing, but nothing you can't handle. Just be prepared for me to overact a little bit next week, as opposed to all the other weeks. That said, our lecture has been a little bit abstract today, and so I'd like for us to conclude on a somewhat more substantive point. So over in the C block, I'll show you a technical innovation in the form of the information set, but we'll talk about it in the context of a really interesting substantive point. See you there. So here in the C block, I want to show you a very interesting model about the rule of law. So the basic idea here is that when, uh, when a nasty dictator is thinking about whether or not to be especially nasty to their citizens, they have to do so in expectation of the citizens coming up to, to throw the repressor out of office via, via nice or not so nice means. So if I'm a dictator and I'm thinking about whether or not to seize stuff from you, I have to think through whether or not I expect that to yield you being nice to me or at least handing me the stuff without fighting or trying to throw me out of office. It turns out there's a lot of wrinkles to that interaction. And so I'm going to show you a nice introductory model of that. And then we'll extend and refine this model a little bit as the weeks pass on for the rest of the class. But the basic idea is actually quite straightforward. So at the beginning of time, the ruler can either repress the people's rights or not repress the people's rights. They can do something really nasty to the people or not so nasty. The idea is that they're going to try to seize some of the stuff from the people. So the same thing is going to happen irrespective. The numbers will change, but the basic interaction after the decision made by the ruler is somewhat straightforward. So after the ruler makes their choice, faction A, one of the factions among the people, can make a choice. So let's say after repression, country A has a choice. They can either protest or not protest. They can either come up in arms and decide to try to throw the bastards out, or they can not do that. The basic idea is that it will be insufficient for a single faction to try to throw the ruler out. It will take cooperation between two factions in society. That's the basic idea here, is that when a ruler makes a choice, they have to think about pushback, but that pushback depends on coordination among the factions in society. So faction A can either protest or not protest, Regardless, after faction A makes its choice, faction B can either protest or not protest. The idea is that protest is costly. You don't want to get caught alone if you protest. You want to protest with a friend because that means you throw the ruler out. So if they both protest, that's going to yield a change in power. And if they don't, then the ruler will be in office and whoever protested is going to have to pay a cost for having gone out into the streets to say, throw the ruler out, and then it didn't happen. It tends not to go well for people. So we'll say if both factions protest, then the ruler gets zero happiness points. Faction A gets eight happiness points and faction B gets eight happiness points. So they get to keep all their stuff. They have eight, they have eight happiness points worth of stuff apiece. So they get to keep all their stuff and the ruler's been thrown out of office. If faction A protests and faction B doesn't, now the ruler gets eight happiness points because they took stuff off of the people and didn't get thrown out. Faction A gets one happiness point because they, didn't, they, they got stuff taken away from them and they paid a cost of protesting without a friend. And faction B gets two happiness points because they had stuff taken away from them, but at least they didn't protest. If faction A doesn't protest and faction B does protest, it's the same thing in reverse. So eight happiness points for the ruler because they took stuff. Two happiness points for faction A because they had stuff taken from them, but they didn't pay the cost of protesting without a friend. And one happiness point for country B because they had stuff taken from them and they made the mistake of protesting without a friend. Finally, if neither faction protests, then it's eight happiness points for the ruler and two happiness points apiece for the factions. They had stuff taken from them, but they didn't have to put up with the problem of protesting without a friend. So 088, eight, eight 812, 821, 822. Now that's all in the world where the ruler decided to repress. What happens if the ruler didn't decide to repress? So if, if the ruler didn't do anything, that's going to be the whole thing the same way, just with a, a better outcome for the for the part for the factions because they didn't have any stuff taken from them. So if the ruler does nothing, faction A protests and faction B protests, then they throw the ruler out. Zero happiness points for the ruler. Eight for, this, eight for faction A and eight for faction B. 
if if the ruler does nothing, faction A protests and faction B doesn't, then it'll be then the ruler stays in office. But because they didn't take stuff, now they have two happiness points. Two happiness points for the ruler. They didn't take anything. Seven happiness points for faction A because they protested without a friend. They could have had eight if they didn't protest, but they protested without a friend and therefore wound up with seven happiness points. And faction B, they're still happy. Nothing got taken from them. They didn't have to protest. Eight happiness points. Same thing in reverse, if the ruler doesn't repress, faction A doesn't protest and faction B protests, well then, that's two happiness points for the ruler who is still in office but hasn't taken anything. Eight happiness points for faction A who hasn't had anything taken from them and didn't make the mistake of protesting without a friend. And seven happiness points for country B who didn't have anything taken from them but made the mistake of protesting without a friend. Finally, as you may have expected, if neither faction protests after the ruler hasn't repressed, that's two for the ruler and eight apiece for the factions. Eight terminal nodes. Eight terminal nodes. Eight different stories. So this is a much more elaborate game than we had before, right? It has eight different endings. But what I want to show you is that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to think about faction B as able to observe what faction A did. As of right now, as the model is currently drawn, the ruler makes a decision, and then faction A observes the decision made by the ruler and makes a decision. And then faction B observes the decision made by the ruler and by faction A and then makes a final decision. That's what happens at each of these paths. Each history is a choice made by, by the ruler, which is observed by faction A, a choice made by faction A, which is which, and then both are observed by faction B, and then faction B makes a choice. Now, it seems to me that in many situations, particularly in authoritarian regimes, it isn't that easy just to go out into the streets and know that somebody's going to observe you. It could well be that these factions are indeed not all that friendly with one another. They may be on different parts of the country. They might not be able to observe one of those actions that perfectly. That might vary. In very urbanized settings, maybe it's easy to see one another. And in very spread out settings, it might be very difficult to see one another. It isn't very hard to imagine in sub-Saharan Africa or other places where the, the, the boundaries of the countries aren't especially good fits for the, for the way that the land is actually driven, uh, divvied up between factions. It isn't that hard to imagine somebody way on the other side of a country that's a relevant decision maker, but that is very geographically isolated and therefore not able to see what happens. Whereas if I'm protesting in, in many areas um, in the Arab Spring where there's like large expanses of nothing and then high urbanization, that's a very different story in terms of which factions can observe which choices. So in order to encode the idea that faction B doesn't get to observe faction A's choice, I'm going to introduce the notion of an information set. So what an information set is, is it takes all of the decision nodes that are controlled by a given player, and it says, these are the decision nodes that the player can distinguish, and these are the decision nodes that they can't. If two nodes are in the same information set, then that means that the decision maker at that decision node can't tell the two nodes apart. All right, so let me just start from the top of the game. So consider the situation where the ruler has repressed and country A has made has to make a decision about whether to protest or not. Let's say verbally, I'm saying to you verbally, that country B won't be able to tell if country A protested. They don't get to see that. That's not something they get to observe. They get to observe whether or not the ruler repressed, but I'm not going to allow them to observe they're not going to be able to get to know what faction A did, okay? To encode that idea, I'm just going to take faction B's two decision nodes here, and I'm gonna circle them with something called an information set. I mean, this is just a drawing. But the idea of the information set is that country B doesn't know which of these two nodes they're at. So the idea is that country B is gonna make one and only one choice here. Before, without the information set, they would get to make one choice after observing protest and a separate choice after not observing protest. But what happens if they don't get to know that? Instead, they make one and only one choice without knowing what's really happened. And so I'm going to, if I circle these two things, that means that there's only one choice made there. Faction B can't tell which of these two nodes they're at. They don't know which of these two decision nodes they're at, which is bad because I'm not sure if you noticed, but these are very different utility numbers depending on what faction B does. So faction B's choice has now been rendered much more nuanced because they don't know what faction A is going to do. Moreover, faction A knows that faction B doesn't observe. 
And so faction A's choice is going to be a lot more nuanced because when they look down the tree, they're going to see another faction that doesn't get to observe choices. So we have just made this very nuanced for both faction B and for faction A. Faction B has a nuanced decision in the fact that they don't know where they are. And faction A has a nuanced decision in the, in the sense that they know what they did, but they also know that faction B isn't going to get a chance to see it. And the same goes down in the world where, fa where the ruler hasn't repressed. I'll put an information set around faction B's decision nodes there. Notice that I have two separate information sets. That's my way of saying that, they get, that faction B gets to observe what the ruler did. Because they observe what the ruler did, they're able to tell the world where they're able to tell this world from this world. They can see the differences between these two worlds. They basically know if we're in the two world or the eight world in terms of what, what the stakes are for them. But what they don't know is what faction A did. If I wanted to say that faction B has no idea about anything, I would just put one big information set around all four of their nodes. But when I split it, that means that they get to know what made the top ones the top ones and the bottom ones the bottom ones, which is to say they get to know what the ruler did. So this information set thing allows us to say, okay, sometimes faction B can observe everything, no information sets drawn. Sometimes they can observe what the ruler did, but not what faction A did. And if that's the case, then I've got two separate information sets. Or sometimes they have no idea what they're doing, they're just flying completely blind, in which case one information set around all four. The bigger the information set, the less you know, the less granular your information is. That seems like an important context when rulers make decisions and when factions make decisions about whether or not to try to throw rulers out. It seems to me that it's very important to know what the appropriate amount of observability is for the relevant stakeholders. That influences not just those who may or may not be able to observe, but those who are making choices whether or not they are to be observed. Fascinating when you think about it that way, right? Those that have information may also act knowing that those that don't have information don't have information, aren't going to be able to detect the decision. If I have a car with the world's most precise speedometer, and I can choose exactly the speed that I want to go, but I know that the law enforcement agent that's watching me drive has a radar gun that rounds to the nearest miles per hour. That means there's an information set at work there. The inability to detect the rounding air says, essentially, everything that is closest to 55 miles an hour is 55. Everything that is closest to 56 miles an hour is 56. Rounding air introduces information sets. It partitions all of my choices into things that you can't distinguish from one another. There's a sensory limitation. What happens if factions have sensory limitations? What happens if countries have sensory limitations? What if they have limitations that s inhibit their ability to detect what has happened prior to them in a sufficiently granular way? That's what we just modeled. And next week we'll learn about what the ramifications of that are, but I hope that that's enough to keep you interested for another week. So what do we talk about today? Well, we talked about time, right? What is time and what does time have to do with strategy? What does strategy have to do with time? See, if I say these things in a different order, they're different things. That's because time plays an, a, 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 an important role in terms of my diction choices. So it seems relevant to in, incorporate time, strategic time, into our models of international relations. This is for many reasons. Um, one is that when I make decisions today, it just isn't true that I'm going to immediately know exactly what the happiness points that I'm going to get out of my decisions will be. What happens depends on future interactions, future choices, future decisions made by other actors. Maybe other actors, maybe me, a different version of myself in the future. One thing that institutions do is they take rules from today to tomorrow. Right? I couldn't possibly know what will be decided upon at the United Nations in 100 years. I couldn't even possibly know what the institution will be shaped like in 100 years. However, I have some sense about what the Plinko game is that takes me from today to there. I have some sense about how to ride time, probabilistically actually, between where I am and where I may wind up. 
and I'm thinking through all the possible happiness points that could be waiting me at the end of this particular Plinko game. There's no way of knowing what will happen for sure, and so we have to incorporate time in a potentially humble way, saying, I don't even know when the last day is going to be, and so I'm going to have infinite interactions. However, even much more simply, all we need to know in terms of basic strategic time is whether threats are credible. If, when I, when I put your feet back to the fire after accepting your threat, if I call your bluff, now a future version of you must actually live up to that, otherwise you're going to pay an audience cost, or something like that. The credibility of a threat, whether or not you will live up to it, the credibility of a peace deal, whether or not I can trust you tomorrow. All of these things require some simple notion of strategic time. Even if I'm not trying to model everything perfectly, even if I just want to pin down the concept of distrust. Distrust in you. Distrust in institutions. Distrust in the agreements that we make with one another. Distrust in unenforceable contracts. That distrust is not a necessarily dynamic thing because you signed the deal today. Think about it. We decide, you, you're a country, I'm a country, we're two countries, and we decide that we're going to declare a very special relationship. We're, we say, in perpetuity, for the rest of time, for the rest of time, as long as humans are on earth, our two countries will be friends with one another. We will never attack one another for the rest of time. We have a big banquet. We have a ball, right? I have to get, I have to buy myself like a special tails and like a white tie. It's very fancy. I have to learn all sorts of etiquette. I have to brush up on how to speak the language that you speak, which apparently is just text speak. I have to brush up on all these things. I have to learn which fork does which. I have to brush up on my dancing. Chewie and I take ballroom classes so that I will look fancy at this big gala where we decided that we were going to sign for the rest of time. And then I wear like one of these sashes across my tuxedo to let you know that I'm a very important person. And you have on a similar sash across your formal attire, whatever it is. And there's a, there's a string quartet and they're playing only very fancy things that nobody's ever quite heard of. We're not talking Paco Bell's Canon and D. We're talking about special music that was made just for this auspicious occasion of our country signing a, for, a forever peace deal. Forever peace deal. We are agreeing. I have signed it. You have signed it. Today, we are feeling very friendly. There is wine. We are smiling with twinkly eyes. There is brie. We are feeling very well fed. I have danced beautifully. You have danced however it is that you dance. All sorts of things have happened. There's only one problem. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. The special pens, the special mahogany things, the poor laureates that, that recited things about how great this is, the brie and the pigs in the blanket and the waltzes and the special music, it's all bullshit. Why? Because you don't know what things are going to look like in 10,000 years. That isn't a credible deal. You want to tell me you're not going to attack me tomorrow? I might believe it. You want to tell me you're my friend forever? Bullshit. 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 Why? Because of time. Because of strategic time. Because of what you just tried to do to bastardize strategic time. And I did too, apparently. I mean, I rented the sash. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. We need to think about credibility. We need to think over the next few weeks about what it would mean for a deal to be self-enforcing enough that we could sign it and actually have a ceremony worth having. That's hard. That's really hard. We need to know what time is and what it does, how it shapes strategy, what it has to do with rationality, all these other things. We have to, we have to answer all these questions, and we will. Not perfectly, but we will. It's hard. But I'm not sure if you noticed, but international relations have been happening for a very long time. The credibility of an agreement, the credibility of a threat, the credibility of, of an alliance or a trade deal or a sanction. These things all depend on the future, whether it's tomorrow, 10,000 years, or forever. What the future is, nobody knows. We can form probabilistic expectations, but it's a very difficult dynamic problem to think through. However, there's something even more foundational at work, if you can believe it, and it's with that more foundational thing in mind that I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. In traditional accounts of causation, Causes precede effects. So I obviously only know so much about these things, but if I look outside and I, and I see the wind blow and there's a flag outside of my house, so there's a flag that's blowing in the wind right now. 
So there's a flag that's blowing in the wind. And I could I could look at it right now. And I see the cloth in the flag waving. It, the, the flag is extended. It's all the way pulled out. And the wind is pushing by it. The wind is causing this flag to do something that it wouldn't do otherwise. Right, the wind blew. And then the flag unfurled. It might have been a very short time frame. But what happened was air started to move. Air started to move by the flag. Air started to move by the flag. And that air rubbed up against some of the flag. And friction happened, and that force began to drag the flag outward. Just imagine it. Just imagine, over time, think about what's happening over time. The air hits the flag, and the flag begins to unfurl, right? And so, as the flag unfurls in the wind, I see it beginning to unfurl, and I see it eventually even start to, to dance a little bit because there's little, the, the wind patterns aren't consistent. It's like a little bit of right? So eventually, I come to see this physical act of, a, of, a, of wind, invisible wind, frictioning onto this flag and eventually unfurling it. What would have happened if the flag unfurled first and then the wind blew? Would you have said that the wind caused it or something else? You'd probably say that something else caused it. It's very natural for us to say to ourselves, causes proceed. If it heats up, then the ice melts. This is just a very natural for us, a way for us to look at things. Whenever something happens, you see something awful. And you immediately say, what happened? You say that, you use a past participle. What happened? What happened in the past to cause what I see in front of me? If you're Miss Marple and you're trying to solve a crime, you look at evidence of the present to try to figure out what happened in the past. You don't try to predict the future. You try to figure out what happened in the past. You want to know what are the causes of this awful tragedy of a murder if it's Miss Marple. You try to look backwards. You look at what's here and you say, the cause of this awful thing happened before. And so I'm going to look backwards. It would be very strange if it rained first and clouds came second. Think about it. Just think, think about how strange that would look. The world would look like it was in reverse. We typically think that the causes come first, and that's the way that things play out in the physical universe. Now, consider something else. So here's a question. What caused you to go to school? Here you are at college, suffering, putting up with me. What caused you to do that? What caused you? Well, presumably some things happened before you got here. Right? So you may have had uh, somebody that you care about tell you to go to college. Somebody from your family or some guidance counselor at your school, one of your teachers when you were growing up. Somebody may have told you to go to college, and that made you decide to go to college. In that sense, there are past actions that influence your decision that caused you to go to college. However, unless you're unlike most people, you probably also made the decision to go to school with the future in mind. You had some expectation. You saw two versions of yourself. The version of yourself that went to college and the version of yourself that didn't go to college. And it, your expectations about what those two versions of yourself look like may have influenced your decision. Right? So you saw the college-educated version of yourself and the not college-educated version of yourself and the differences between those two versions, whether it was their salary, whether it was how awesome they were, whether it was they could quote things on demand, whether it was they could make stupid movies if they ever needed to to teach other people, whatever it is. Some difference in the future versions of yourself caused you to make a decision. So it wasn't just previous stuff. It was your mind's mo expectations at that moment in time. It was your expectations of the future. It wasn't the future itself. It was your expectations of the future. This is one of the weird things about brains, among other things, and volition, among other things, is that it does this weird thing to causation in time. If I buy a stock, what caused me to buy a stock? My expectations of its future value. What would it mean for me to change that? Think about an experiment. If I, was, if I was a physical scientist, if I wanted to know the causes of rain, I could run experiments. I could run physical experiments 
change the cloud structure or something. Apparently, I have a very well-funded study where I can change the weather. But I could change the clouds. I could change the patterns of clouds and then check to see what the subsequent changes in the rain would be. If I want to know the causes of rain, I could, I could play around with, with, with whatever I think the preceding cause is, tweak it a little bit, and then see what happens in the future. And because it's an experiment, I can have many different versions of that. I can repeat the trials. That's what experiments do is they allow you to re repeat something. You know, go back to the beginning, change the cause, see what happened to the effect. Go back to the beginning again, change the cause again, see what happened to the effect. Hold everything else fixed. Keep Cetera Super Paribus. But I can keep going back. I can keep going back to the beginning of time. If I'm an experimentalist, I'm the god of a tiny little world where I, con I control time. I can say go back to the beginning. Now suppose I wanted to run such an experiment to see why I bought a stock. What would I change? How could I say change your expectations of the future? It's not the same process, right? I would have to, you would have to, I would have to give you different information. I, whatever your decision-making rule is for forming expectations of the future, I would have to change the information that you have. So in other words, data about yesterday inform your expectations of tomorrow and force you to make a decision today. Yesterday informs tomorrow causes today. What our, what our minds do as, when we're making decision makers under strategic time is they unify the past, the present, and the future in a way that's really hard to think through, right? I mean, that, like, everything is kind of Slaughterhouse-Five if you let it be. There's Tremalfadorians everywhere. But causes proceed. This is just one of those things that we do in our mind. You don't even realize it. This is just something our brain does. There's a past. There's a future in expectation that's informed by the past. And this causes decisions to be made. Think about the original deterrence model that I showed you. What could be the causes of making a threat? That first decision made by Country 8 was at the beginning of time. Nothing could precede it. Does that mean that nothing can cause it? Or does that mean that we need a word other than cause? Is it possible for something to cause the first decision ever made? Other than the information that was available at the time, which would have been very little because it's day one. What causes the first decision and interaction other than expectations of the future? The future, this is something that we do in our brain. We have devices in our brain that turn the that, that look ahead to the future, turn that to an expectation, and then allow us to make decisions today. Strategic time throws off a lot about causation. Strategic time does. Now maybe cause is just the wrong word. Maybe causes, maybe, maybe a rational decision maker can't be caused to go one way or another the same way. That a flag can I, can, I can come up with the causes of flags being unfurled or of ice melting. Whatever the causes of those things are, there's no volition involved. And we're going to see next week that our decision makers have to make decisions today after thinking very hard about what will happen in the future. It will very much be the case that something about the future will seemingly cause the decisions made today. However, causes proceed. Maybe that forces some scope limitations on our enterprise. Maybe it's impossible for us to really learn the causes of strategic decisions, the causes of expectations, the causes of information. Maybe that's just not the right word. But if it isn't, then what is? Is whatever the right word is, is it as lofty a goal as the causal goal that has driven so much of science? Is this a lesser enterprise because it is more nuanced? It's a hard thing to think through, isn't it? There isn't a right answer. Whether or not we could ever get to call what we're doing a real set of physics in a real universe is beyond my grasp. But it seems to me that all of this is so fascinating and so humiliating that we have no choice but just to keep going and then see what happens. I don't know what caused me to choose to say that just now, but I'm looking forward to seeing what plays out. I hope you are too. But in the meantime, 
Thanks for watching.